I know we're having a good time, but I'd like to call the Gurney Village Board regular meeting of December 18th, 2017 to order. Roll call, please, Andy. Ross. Here. Garner. Here. Thomas. Present. Hood. Here. Thorstenson. Here. Jacobs. Here. Six present. All right. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, God and God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. That's our last meeting, right? Yep. Oh. Oh, so sad. It's our last meeting of 2017. We just want to kind of keep that year going on. Uh, first up is public comment. If you'd like to address the board about something that's not on the agenda tonight, you can come to the microphone and state your name. Public comment. If you'd like to address the board tonight. <laughs> All right. <laughs> There'll be another opportunity at the end of the meeting, so I'll move on. Do I have a um, motion to approve the consent so agenda as presented? Second. Motion by Trustee Balmas, second by Trustee Garner. Roll call, please, Andy. Ross. Aye. Garner. Aye. Balmas. Aye. Hood. Yes. Thorstenson. Yes. Jacobs. Aye. Six aye. All right, motion carries. Patrick, please read the consent agenda into the record. Item number one. Approval of the minutes from the November 27, 2017 and December 4, 2017 Village Board meetings. At number two, approval of Ordinance 2017-56, amending Chapter 32, Section 32-36, entitled Planning and Zoning Fees of the Gurney Municipal Code. At number three, approval of payroll for period ending December 8, 2017 in the amount of $1,084,635.59. At number four, approval of bills for period ending December 24, 2017 in the amount of three million thirty one thousand one hundred forty six dollars and twenty three cents all right do i have a motion to the move. approve the consent agenda as read in the record motion by trustee garner second by trustee jacobs roll call please andy ross aye. garner aye Balmas. aye hood yes thorstenson yes jacobs aye. six aye all right motion carries we'll move on to petitions and communications the first is approval of a proclamation designating January 2018 as Lake County Crime Stoppers Month in the Village of Gurney. Crime Stoppers of Lake County is a nonprofit organization primarily funded by private donations, and Crime Stoppers of Lake County has paid cash rewards to persons <laughs> providing information leading to over 6,759 arrests and convictions and the recovery of over $29.9 million worth of contraband and recovered stolen property since April 26, 1983. And Crime Stoppers of Lake County benefits the citizens and the businesses, business community in and around the Village of Gurney by partnering with them and with surrounding law enforcement agencies. And the Village of Gurney and the Gurney Police Department fully support the efforts of Crime Stoppers of Lake County. Now, therefore, I, Christina Kavarik, Mayor of the Village of Gurney, Lake County, Illinois, do hereby encourage support for Crime Stoppers of Lake County and proclaim January 2018 as Lake County Crime Stoppers Month in the Village of Gurney. Do I have a motion to approve? Motion to approve. Motion by Trustee Thorstenson, second by Trustee Balmas. All in favor say aye. 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 All right. Proclamation carries. Next up is a discussion of the 2018 trick-or-treat hours. A lot of varying opinions in the community. Um, I've heard from a lot of people. I think um, Jack <coughs> supplied us. Yeah, we did with, have. I'm yeah. Not, yeah, it might have been in the last packet, yeah, actually. I know I had two phone calls, and I think we had four emails that we had included in the packet, but just casual conversation. Um, since it was a radical departure from past habits, we thought we'd bring it back for discussion. Um, we do have some audience members that want to address the board on the topic, so I'll let them go first before I open it up to trustees. So if you want to address the board, young ladies, you can come to the microphone. It's good to see you again. Introduce yourselves. 
Hi, I'm Skylar. I go to Viking Middle School. I'm Clara. I also go to Viking Middle School. I'm Abby, and I go to Viking Middle School as well. Last year, we changed trick-or-treating and gurney to Saturday, and we really enjoyed it. Others also enjoyed it. We put together a video explaining why we enjoyed it, and I hope you enjoy it. It shows kids from our school. Okay. Well, All right. Very good. We have entertainment tonight. This is cutting edge for us. We changed trick-or-treating and gurney to a Saturday, and we and others really enjoyed it. There have been some complaints, and we want to keep it on a Saturday. So we gathered up students from our school, and we filmed them explaining why they enjoy trick-or-treating on Saturday. And here they are. My name is Madison, and I like trick-or-treating better on Saturday because you can stay up later, and you can eat more candy. On Saturday, because more people are outside, and plus, sometimes the weather changes, and also sometimes the candy be gone for trick or treating. My name is Carla, and I like trick or treating on Saturday because I feel like you get more candy and enjoy the time on Saturday instead of it being school the next day. I'm in risk Cassandra, and I think that. Trick or treating should be on Sunday, Saturday because um, you should just relax on Sunday and you don't have to go out on the table. My name is Caitlin and I like trick or treating on Saturday because I got to have a sleep with my friends and eat a bunch of candy that I don't have to worry about. You're the tech guy. It's off the internet. Um, you should just relax on Sunday and you don't have to go out on the table. My name is Caitlin and I like trick or treating on Saturday because I got to have a sleep with my friends and eat a bunch of candy that I don't have to worry about. Nope, same spot. Why don't you try the other thing? Turn it off and turn it on again. <laughs> Slam the top of the... <laughs> They need a bunch of candy. I don't have to worry about getting up the next day. I like trick or treating on Saturday because I got to stay up as late as I wanted and I have to go to school the next day being super tired. Uh, I like trick or treating on Saturday because I guess it gives kids a chance to go trick or treating a day before they have to go to school. I'm Lizzie and I like trick or treating on Saturday. Because instead of waiting the next day before school, um, that way kids don't um, stay play and get high with kids. I am Jackie, and I like trick or treating on Saturday because we get to trick or treat earlier. My name is Jude, and I like trick or treating on Saturday because it's earlier than all the other days, and we get to have candy and uh, I guess. You have more time to eat it during Sunday when you wake up in the morning. I'm Eric and I like Eric and I like to be on Sunday because then I don't have to worry about school after. 
Hi, my name is Quinea and I like to be eating on Saturday because I don't have to get up on school early the next day. Hi, I'm Lisa. I like to be eating on Saturday. I'm good here because I wanted to have sleep over. effort. Um, I had a lot of parents kind of confirm um, what the, the girls have kind of showed us. Is there anyone else who'd like to comment tonight? Address the board? Okay. All right. Now you need to stand at the microphone and state your name for the record. It's, it's right there in the center. Yeah. All right. My name is Andrea Harris and Two of the, the little blonde girls are mine. And um, thank you for watching that. I understand that's very much like the kid's point of view of why that was so great, which is obviously not always the parent's experience. So I understand that there was plenty of conflicting opinions. And I did take a few of the ones that I thought were strongly represented at the last time this came up at the meeting. And I just would like to speak to the other side of it. Um, the first thing is to the credit of the village, because there was some kind of insinuation that there was not ample enough time for people to accommodate the Sunday to the Saturday, and that people were shocked by it and were like, what? I thought it was you know, Sunday. Um, we actually knew of this date change six weeks prior to trick-or-treating the year before when they first brought this to the board. So it, it, it was in the works a long time. And then there was more than a year's notice of, hey, next year, this is gonna be on Saturday instead of Sunday. And then that wasn't the only notice because I would say probably starting late summer, lots of emails, lots of social media, lots of messages from the village, all of the ways that you guys send messages, it was in all of them. So, I mean, obviously it was no surprise to me because. Uh, you know, like them, but I, I actually don't know any one person who was like, what? Oh my God, I planned my whole life around Sunday instead of Saturday, which is why we pushed it out a whole year to make that not suck for people who did actually do that. Um, the other issue is why. I think there's this feeling that we're doing this because we just have a group of kids who are like stomping their feet and saying, I want Saturday. This is all about the parents. Um, no parent wants to do that from two to five on a Sunday and then have their kids come back in the house, take your costumes off, take a shower, it's dinner time, put your candy away, go to bed, you're getting up at six o'clock in the morning, it's over. That sucks, it sucks for us. Like parents would like to also incorporate our own kind of parent fun time in trick-or-treating and not have a time limit and be able to have it yeah, it's a family gathering. It's a friend gathering. You see groups of large people out there, like doing all of their own family stuff. And it's just really nice not to have it be on a school night. I have plenty of teacher friends who are like, oh my God, thank you so much. Because they have a much harder job than those of us who are not school teachers. Like they actually have to really be somebody the next day for the students. And I just, I feel like it's mean <laughs> a little bit to me, to the kids, to, like to everyone. And I, I do understand the other opinion. Not everyone has little kids trick-or-treating. It's definitely more convenient for their schedule, but that's kind of where I stand on that. Um, there was one last concern that bothered me a little bit, probably the most, and it was a safety concern that was brought up at the meeting, a concern that said something along the lines of the people that live on the east side of 41 are forgotten or like nobody cares about them so you can make all the rules you want over on the west side and it doesn't matter um, because of the proximity to North Chicago, Waukegan, Park City, Zion. Um, I've lived on the east side of 41 since I was 11 years old, moved here from Colorado. I actually used to live more on the east side of 41, so, but now I'm a little closer, but I'm still on the east side. And one of my favorite things about my neighborhood is the diversity. I love it. I absolutely love it. I love 
the different houses, like the, the years that they've been built, the amount of different cultures that are brought into the neighborhood. And it's been like that for so long that this complaint, that when we moved it from Sunday to Saturday, was that all of a sudden there was a whole bunch of people there that were clearly from Zion or Park City or Waukegan, made no sense to me. I don't know how you can tell. I don't know. I lived there my whole life, and I don't know how you can tell the difference. And so what? Trick-or-treating is about community, not just your five-block radius. It's about our whole town, no matter what part of Gurney you live in, and it's about family. I have a sister who lives not in Gurney. Every year, she comes to trick-or-treat in Gurney in my neighborhood, even though she lives somewhere else. Many other people have the exact same experience. We look forward to it. We love it. Um, and the trick-or-treating in cars thing, that can't be intimidating. We live in Chicago. At the end of October, it is very often cold, really cold. We throw our kids in cars all the time. If it's warm enough, we pull a trailer. But if it's not, we pull them in cars. And we don't pull them in cars. That's horrible. We put them in cars and drive and let them walk up and down the street, come back, hop in the car. Um, I don't know, but I just don't, I didn't find anything intimidating about it. There was no difference from Saturday to Sunday, except for the day. Um, to boycott trick-or-treating because it's on Saturday instead of a Sunday, it, it sounds silly to me. And I understand all of the conflicting opinions, but I just wanted to put it out there that, I mean, and you guys do a great job patrolling, like every, like other block, there's a police car or there's somebody out. I mean, there's literally no, no fear, <laughs> no fear. If it's not on the same day as everyone else's day, that's okay. There are other communities that do it on Halloween, close by us, and guess what? Then we go there, <laughs> like, and they don't yell at us. <laughs> so, yeah, the grown-up point of view to go with that video. Thanks. All right, thank you. Um, any other public comment? Uh, yeah, we've always had complaints when we've had it on Sunday about children coming from other neighborhoods, so I've been very cognizant of that, and I have, over the last few years, determined that a lot of it are kids in our school system, but they don't live within our municipal boundaries. They, the kids do like to come and trick-or-treat with their friends and their friends' neighborhoods, so I think people often forget how large both our school districts are and how much of a bigger area, so, but the schools themselves are within Gurney and so they naturally gravitate here. I have heard no one tell me that there was an uptick in kids by moving it to Saturday. Um, and I, while some of the comments were not very nice, um, I did hear from a lot of parents. So I'm, I'm anxious to hear from you guys. I heard from a lot of parents who did not want to say anything on social media because of what was going on. Um, but they said it was a lot more fun being able to extend into the evening hours as a family, not having to rush the kids to bed, not having to worry about homework and school and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then we, I, you know, there was negative, but I got more positives than negatives, but I need to hear from you guys. Now, our partners, the park district, the school district, the township, they will accommodate Saturday as long as we give them ample notice. So we would, based on the feedback we get today, we would set this in January. So all sports and all that stuff can kind of work around the Halloween schedule. So that's not an issue. It wasn't this year because they had ample notice. I want to make sure they get it next year too. Um, anybody else hear any feedback, good or bad? Or I guess it's not bad feedback, but positive or negative about Saturdays and Sundays? I know you're, a, you're an October 31st person. <laughs> Um, but Mike, our trustee, no Jacobs. negative, no negative feedback. Okay. Yeah. Um, Thornton. So some of my neighbors asked if we were doing anything to quantify the feedback. And, um, so it sounds like you gave, you said proportionately it was positive. Yeah. Cause I had a coffee right after that. So it was fairly easy for me and I'm at a lot of events. So I wanted to make sure that I was getting a balanced view versus the emails and the two phone calls. Um, but again, 
how do we quantify any of our decisions? It's what we hear from residents. So um, only a handful took the time to be negative, but you know, then that puts us in the bubble if we don't reach out or hear or go out and talk to other residents. Well, I didn't count the number of students that were on the video, but it seemed like there was maybe 20 that were supportive of it, towards it, so I think we could add those in, and, and therefore I support it. I know you had a bad experience on <laughs> Halloween. <laughs> you probably just want to skip Halloween altogether. <laughs> well, if I may add, I mean, the, the, the um, negative feedback that we got from uh, our one resident last month that came in, um, I, I don't know if she actually took the time to weigh her views and do her research because when she came in and was very accusatory, um, I, I know that she didn't take the time to review how the vote and the considerations were made because I know that uh, some of us did not actually participate in the making of those decisions. So I, I do not know how well reasoned her views were on the subject. So I think we have to look at and consider everything that's said pro and con on the subject w with a grain of salt. Um, and, you know, I, I think everybody does have a, a um, you know, does have a, 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 a <clears throat> have a, an opinion on the subject. And I think we need to listen to them, but understand that some of them may not be very well reasoned and well thought out. Trustee Garner, I know you have kids still in the school. Um, yeah, I, I just think, you know, we have to remember that Halloween is about the kids. Um, as adults, sometimes we can get too serious about it. I think we should do everything we can do to make it as fun as possible. I mean, you know, we our Halloweens were a little different, but it was like a big free-for-all. I mean, it's wide open. You could do, you know, and be whoever you wanted to be on Halloween, and you had a lot of fun. There was no... Uh, there was nothing, no obstacles in our way. Why should we put a bunch of obstacles in their way? Um, as for my house, I didn't get enough kids. You know, I bought a bunch of candy that ended up eating it myself. Um, so I want more kids to come to my house. And, and again, it's an opportunity for uh, um, the adults to really invest in the kids. I mean, you'd be surprised at, you know, one short, tiny conversation, you can make a huge difference in a kid's life no matter who that kid is. And I, I just think we should take those opportunities. You know, they're coming to us for a piece of candy. And you can say a kind word or something that may pick that kid up and turn them around and do something for them. And I, I think, you know, we have to be careful of shutting down those opportunities. Um, so well said what you said in terms of, of diversity. It's very important that we have diversity in everything that we do. I'm a big proponent of that. And um, we don't hear it enough, so I commend you for, for having the courage to stand up there and, and make that a major point of view. Um, so, you know, if the kids want it on a Saturday, I'm like, have it on Saturday. Now, as adults, we do need to do our part to make sure it's a safe t time for the kids, but we want to also make it a fun time for the kids and not detract from it. So. You know, and you're always, you know, you know, it's difficult to make everybody happy. But again, if we remember it's about the kids, I think that, um, you know, Halloween will survive and so will they. Trusty Bombs, I know that you want it on Halloween. <laughs> but if you can't have it on Halloween, do you have an opinion about Saturday or Sunday? Yeah, I, well, granted I didn't do a survey of kids or anything, but I... I did hear a lot of negative about it being on a Saturday from a few, you know, do I have thousands giving me a call? No. But those who I, the circle in which I was, were not pleased about it and thought it was not the smartest thing. But that's adults. So I would take a challenge. You know, it just, everybody has a different point of view, so... And, you know, I am, have always been a proponent for it being on Halloween because that's what it is. And there's obviously a lot of communities for all those people who say, oh, no, it can't be on Halloween. I, it's too inconvenient. Well, there's a lot of communities that have it on Halloween. Yeah, and 
you know, I, I still think it should be on that day. So that's... All right. Trustee Hood? Yeah, I don't have any thoughts one way or the other. All right. Um, Chief, oh. I, okay, I'm going to let Chief go after you. Okay. Trustee Ross. Well, I think the hard part is that we're the only community that's doing it. So if if we really feel that that's important, maybe we should be the ones talking to the rest of the people in the county and telling them it was successful and maybe trying to get everybody to change because that's the hard part when we're the only one. Um, and it, it, then it does become confusing. And um, I don't know. That's We can certainly try that. It's, not to it, if, it's if, a thought. It, 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 we've been trendsetters before. I know. <laughs> um, I know the teachers. I've heard, I heard from quite a few teachers. But I would, not to put you on the spot, Chief would say, but there was no unusual police activity or traffic or anything that was a result of moving. From a police department perspective, there's no difference between doing it on Saturday or doing it on Sunday. Okay. Kind of what I thought. Um, all right, I'm not getting a feel for, I mean, I'm getting the sense that not, and you and I are in the same age group, but it, it does seem it's kind of been an age thing too. Younger parents with the younger kids, very active lifestyles, felt Saturday was better. The negatives did come from people kind of setting their way older. <laughs> um, I did not hear, I mean, yeah, the, no complaints really from anybody under 50. Um, so, um, <laughs> um, and I, I'm in that older category too, but I, you know, it really didn't matter to me. So, our, from a Saturday or Sunday standpoint, it doesn't matter. I'm a traditionalist. I love Halloween. Yeah, I know. But I Saturday, know. Sunday, six of one, half dozen of the other. I, th I think it's taken way too much time. It's three hours out of the whole year. So, yeah. I, you know, let's. All right, I get the sense we're okay with Saturday. We will form, do we form, we formally. Yeah, we'll put it on the next agenda. Okay. I, I thought I sent Jack's memo out before about what we heard back through the website, social media. I don't, we may not have, but I'll email that out to the village board so you'll have that. So after looking at that, if you have a huge change of mind, then let the mayor know before we set the agenda. Otherwise, for the January 8th meeting, I think is our, our next meeting, 8th or 9th, 9th. Um, we will set it for Saturday, unless I hear from the mayor otherwise, okay. and then take a formal vote. Yes, yeah, we have to let the schools and the park district know and the township so that sporting events can be done appropriately. All right, thank you for your time and your effort and an excellent video. That was a unique way of doing it. So, um, all right, we'll move on to the important business of the night, which is... Well, that's not my agenda. The report, the first one is from Brian and Scott for the fiscal year 2019 through 2023 multi-year capital plan. This is a draft, but a very first step, very important first step. Yeah, so as we've done uh, the past couple of years, we always bring the capital plan forward here first. Um, as the mayor said, this is in draft format right now. Um, so it is subject to change as we continue to progress throughout the budget process and take a look at where we're at from the revenue and expenditure standpoint. Um, but we got together with the departments. Um, you know, we try to we lay this out on a five-year uh, rolling plan. So obviously next year is focused in the most. Um, the following fiscal year, fiscal year a little more, and then the following three years after that are kind of just you know throw stuff at a at a dartboard that we know is coming up. So. Um, Scott and Brian worked on putting this together, so they're going to walk you through it tonight, go through our major um, infrastructure, equipment and maintenance, buildings, etc. Let you know what's in there at this point. Again, as we continue to move out through the budget process, um, anything that you have questions on or something looks funny or something you think needs to be changed, um, obviously let us know. At this point, we're shooting to have the budget book to the board. Um, in mid-February, try to get the village board members in for the one-on-ones or the two-on-ones with um, Brian and I the end of February, and then our budget hearing is set for March 5th at 5 o'clock. Like so, so I'll kick, kick it to Brian and Scott. All right. Thank you, Pat. <clears throat> um, included in the material was the draft document 
no changes here from last year on the makeup of the document, eight sections, uh, kind of a higher level overview and then details into each system and then the appendix is simply just our fixed asset policy in the back. So, uh, Looking at our funding strategy, not a whole lot's changed from last year. Uh, we re remain primarily pay-as-you-go, uh, with the exception of the Knowles Road Water Tower, which uh, we're looking at an IEPA loan that'll start ramping up here fairly quickly, um, at least for a portion of that. Um, obviously, being pay-as-you-go gives us flexibility with, as we're primarily relying on economically sensitive revenues, it gives us that flexibility to scale up and down on the capital side as needed. Um, large part of the water and sewer side, um, is, or non-water and sewer side, excuse me, is funded from home rule sales tax. Uh, on the water and sewer side, we look at that long-term rate plan uh, where we talked about that Jawa rate dropping off a little bit there to help us bolster that capital plan. Uh, also, general fund surpluses, that's a significant source. Um, it's one of the reasons why we budget so conservatively in the general fund and the water and sewer fund. Uh, obviously, we transfer those funds at the end of the year um, if they're available to uh, help fund capital purchases. Um, and then finally, we talked about through the forecast in the last couple of years utilizing uh, expired debt service to also bolster the funding for the capital plan. Uh, just looking real high level at the numbers here, uh, the plan for fiscal year 2009, or 2019, sorry, wow, uh, totals 11.9 million, uh, includes 5.6 million in water and sewer projects, most notably in there, the Knowles Road Tower in fiscal year 19 and 20. Uh, almost three and a half million in transportation, one and a half million in vehicles and equipment, uh, 865,000 on buildings, and 470,000 on stormwater management. We'll go over each one of those in more detail, or I should say Scott will, most of those points. So, uh, Looking at it over the five-year period, the plan totals $54 million. Uh, largest is the transportation system, 19.3 million, followed by water and sewer at 15.9, uh, 9.5 on buildings. Uh, and building improvements that includes in the out years 20 fiscal year 22 and 23 to get it on get it in somewhat in focus here fire station number three um, 7.7 .7 million on vehicles and equipment and 1.6 million on stormwater management over the five-year period so uh, looking at uh, where that plan is accounted for and funded uh, we have three funds the capital improvement fund for the 2019 plan is 6.1 million Water and sewer fund for 2019, 5.7 million, and then 75,000 from MFT. And Scott's going to talk a little bit about uh, changing how we use MFT funds, try to be a little more efficient, get a little more bang for our buck there. So, uh, one note you will see there's no 911 fund included in this uh, with the consolidation that is now under the authority of the joint ETSB. So, we did not include them in here. Um, however, it is still a significant source of capital funding for 911, but it's included in that budget. And just looking at same, same thing over five years, uh, capital fund almost 34 million, water and sewer fund 16.7 million, and MFT 3.4 million there. So uh, that's kind of higher level spending on, uh, on the systems and where it comes from. And Scott will go into more detail for each system. Okay, we'll start off with the transportation system. Uh, this is our largest uh, capital value system that we have out there that we invest in on an annual basis. Uh, the transportation, we break it into two different types of systems, including pedestrian and vehicular. Uh, and you can see our statistics up there. Our approach towards this is to maintain the existing level of service that we have and then and try to improve upon the quality of our roads. And then the new strategic plan has given us the guidance to improve upon the pedestrian facilities that are provided to the community. Uh, so we have about 120 miles of roads. If we want to try and resurface those with a new wearing surface about every 20 years, that's going to average out to about six miles of resurfacing roadway each year. We provide some detail in here for the roadway projects for fiscal 19 and fiscal 20. Uh, beyond that, we just provide plug numbers because it's too hard to project where we need to be in those years. Uh, there's a couple of different factors that go into these decision processes. Uh, you know, different winters, different seasons, uh, water main quality underneath the pavement, things of that nature are all decision factors that we take into account when recommending a program to the board. One of the recommendations I'm making for this year is to change our use of motor fuel tax funds. Uh, the motor fuel tax is collected by the state of Illinois, which dictates how it is utilized. It's a flat 19 cents per gallon tax. It hasn't changed in over 15 years at this point. Our revenue stream from that tax is continuing to decline on an annual basis. Uh, this year, we're expecting maybe $800,000 in revenue to come in that, but we're not entirely convinced that that's actually all going to come through. 
For that reason, I am recommending that we hold off next year and not do a motor fuel tax program. The reason for that is that when we do take the state money, we are subject to state reporting requirements. It takes additional staff time on our end to prepare those documents, and we have to approach the village board on several action items as well for resolutions to expend those funds. So what we are recommending is holding off on the motor fuel tax next year, letting that money accrue in that account. Uh, and then in fiscal 20, we basically use two years of revenue, which we would hope to be about $1.5, $1.6 million on top of the capital funds to make the highest and best use of those funds and the extra labor that is involved in utilizing those funds. How did you get to that? I don't understand that jump. You said 100000 and then you said second year $1.5 million. There's about $800,000 a year in revenue from the more fuel tax, so we would accrue two years of revenue for about 1.5 to 1.6. Okay, thank you. It, and so that works out with the state? Is that, I mean, they hold it then? We actually hold the money in our own we'll accounts. We'll get the money. Yes, yes. And we just hold on to it. And we hold on to it in our accounts. Before we expend it, we do have to make sure that everything is you know, approved by the state of Illinois. Expending that money is dictated by statute, so we, we, it has to be invested into the transportation networks in the community. So we can hold it. Yes. And yes. spend it. Later. Yes, correct. So we provided uh, two maps up here, and I want to point out on these fiscal, um, fiscal year 16 and the next one will be fiscal year 19 maps. These are the pavement condition indices that we've provided. Um, the, the block areas are the areas we've spent a lot of time in the last three years in making improvements. Uh, we're going to flip the slide here in a, just a moment, and um, one of the things I want you to focus on is uh, Ravinia Woods, Stonebrook, uh, bittersweet area over here on the east side of town, Magnolia, Belle Plaine, uh, north and south of Grand. Uh, and if you want to go ahead and flip that. You can see there's a significant more amount of blue at this point indicating the new roads. You know, As you are well aware, we spent a lot of money on Magnolia and Belle Plaine. Those are our two major uh, collector roads on the east side of town. Uh, after three years, we are done with that. And uh, the, the results are fantastic. You know, Stonebrook, Ravinia, Bittersweet is all looking really good now. Uh, as you can see, though, you know, every year that goes by, roads do continue to deteriorate. So while we made improvements on these segments, we did start losing stuff like Greystone and the Greystone subdivisions. So you start to see the deterioration curves increase. Uh, Greystone's about 15 years old now. Uh, it's the first resurfacing since original construction. And it's getting to that point where we need to start looking at that in the next three to five years. On the total fund, we're looking to expend about $3.5 million into the transportation system. We'll earmark about $200,000 of that for engineering consultants to help out with the rogue program. Uh, the bottom line here, we have about $2.6 million we're going to be doing in resurfacing. Again, this excludes motor fuel tax. Uh, so this is just general fund, capital funds only. Uh, we fit, at this point, I'm pretty comfortable that we can do about a million and a half dollars in-house Beyond that, we need additional resources, either an additional in-house staff or consulting staff. So the consulting plug there is about one full-time equivalent for the summer months, and then the additional charges will actually be used for design for the following year, which would be 20, and or material testing that we have to do to make sure that the quality of the mixes and concrete and everything like that is up to spec. And as directed by the Board of Trustees, uh, we do have $100,000 earmarked for East Grand Avenue and that's to help revitalize East Grand Avenue Corridor. Uh, this year, you're well aware, we did some landscaping improvements out there and uh, with great success. Uh, we are also gonna be doing some concrete work out there uh, probably early next spring into next summer, so that's already been awarded. Uh, we did that a couple months ago. We have $175,000 being proposed in the budget for new sidewalks. Uh, the, what I'm looking for next year is probably gonna be like Washington Street and Hunt Club, trying to get that pedestrian connection completed. Um, I also have carryover funds on this because we just awarded the Knowles Road Path. It's not under construction yet. We expect them to start in March-ish, weather permitting. So, but if it's not done before May 1st, I do need to carry that money into the next fiscal year. So that's kind of a carryover. Uh, street lighting is a new item for this year. We have actually been doing street light upgrades on the roadway networks as we repave them. So the engineering division goes out. We fix the sidewalks, the curbs and gutters, replace the road. Public Works Department's actually been following up behind us as we do those in the last couple of years and replacing out the streetlights. We're upgrading them to LED technology. We're upgrading the poles themselves, uh, making things, improving the whole area. Um, this allows us to get out of that neighborhood and stay out of there for 15 years so we don't have to come back. So this year, we're, I'm pulling it out as a separate line item so we can accurately cost for, uh, account for those costs. 
the 2019 program, uh, in this 2018 construction season, our big one this year is going to be Almond Road. So we talked about this a couple months ago, I think in June, July. We have about a one, $1.2 million Almond Road improvement. We're going to be resurfacing entire length of Almond Road from Washington Street up to Grand Avenue. Included in that will be an intersection improvement at Data. We are currently going through design phases on that, and at this time we are looking at doing a mini roundabout. We don't have enough acreage to do a full-blown roundabout with you know, landscaping in the center, but we can do something with a mountable median out there. We're not done yet. We're still working on that, so if you have any feelings on that one way or the other, please do not hesitate to bring them to my attention. As you can see, we're also going to do some sporadic uh, resurfacings. Uh, Stonebrook area up in, oh, let's, see, let's see, Boulder's up there, some in Providence Oaks, and then on the east side of town again. In fiscal 2020, uh, you can see we're doing a little more capital spend here on, on the transportation network. Uh, crack ceiling, so this is just normal preventative maintenance for sealing up cracks in the asphalt pavements. The consulting light items increasing here, as you can see, because the roadway line item at the very bottom there is also increasing commensurately. So those two are kind of linked together. Uh, East Grand at 100,000. At this point, uh, we don't have any specific items we're going to be doing at that at this point. It's because it's two years out. Sidewalks, same thing. I don't have a specific project, although we have a lot of great ideas from the Blue Ribbon Commission, so we know where we want to go with that, and it's just a matter of you know, cherry-picking the right project to fit that budget amount. And again, the street lighting item will be programmed into 2020 as well. The roadway program uh, is shown here, so we're starting to get into those areas that we've seen declines in. Uh, we have Greystone specifically, which I just called out. That one is actually programmed in there for 2020 fiscal which would be the 2019 construction season. And then we're going to continue to work our way out of like Providence Oaks and start working into the Providence Villages areas. Stormwater management. Uh, this system includes all of our conveyance, storage, and flood risk reduction activities that we undertake. Our approach here is to maintain the existing level of service throughout the community. In fiscal 19, uh, we're divvying up $470,000 as follows. I've got $110,000 earmarked for floodplain acquisition. We have three properties, one on Emerald and two on Kilbourne, that are currently in the FEMA process. They have har a very high ROI with FEMA. We're very confident that we have a good run to obtain those properties. Our local match, 25%, would equal about $110,000 for the three of those. The other items that we're going to be doing is after the, uh, the rain events we had this summer, we have an idea of where we have to do some drainage improvements out there. There's a lot of small stuff that I have included in this, um, but one of the bigger ones we have is the Providence Village area. Um, I've got about $250,000 earmarked for Providence Village. That'll only be phase one, uh, just because of the size of the community that's going to be impacted. This is a line item that's coming out of our discussions that we had at the last month's discussion regarding the Providence Village drainage situation. In fiscal 2020, the number increases even higher. Uh, what will happen here is we were at earmarking additional funding in 2020 for lift station improvements. And these are pump stations that are required to mechanically pump water out of detention basins. We don't have many pump stations for the stormwater system, um, but the ones that we do have, we do need to maintain them. The pumps are very expensive to run and operate, um, so we want to stay on top of those and replace them on a regular basis. On the utility side of things, uh, we are responsible for maintaining the sewer and water systems in the village of Gurney. Our goal here is to maintain the existing level of services. We are looking at our biggest project that we've seen in recent history uh, coming on the, the very near horizon here. So as you are well aware, the Knowles Road Water Tower has been moving forward. Uh, we are complete with the design of the tower and the tank itself. Uh, design work is currently underway on our pumping station, which will be located near the Bittersweet Golf Course Maintenance Shed. So for next year, uh, realistically, I expect we'll probably be out to bid here right after the new year on the tank itself. We could probably be under construction by May 1st, June 1st of next year. Uh, that'll be followed up by another contract for the pump station, which will follow after the tank is, is starting to go vertical. So we have money included in the budget for both of those items. Can I ask you one quick question? Of course. It's just curiosity. Why do we have 134 miles of storm sewer and only 84 miles of sanitary sewer? Storm sewer goes into backyards a lot, so we have laterals that go up side yards and into backyards to pick up. So it's just more about, okay. Yeah. It so seemed like it should be the same, but. Sanitary just kind of runs right down the center of the street. Storm sewer has a lot of laterals that come off of it. Okay. I'm just curious. Good question. <coughs> Fiscal 19, uh, we have professional services budgeted at 250. I envision this being used to help with construction oversight on the water tower. 
Um, as great as our staff is, uh, none of us have actually ever built a water tower, so uh, we generally know what they're supposed to look like, uh, but uh, we're probably going to need some help with the details on that. So I do anticipate we'll bring on one body um, that should consume about that amount. On the distribution side, I have $840,000 plugged in. This is going to be to replace the Hunt Club Road water main between Washington Street and Gages Lake. Um, if you remember my slide a couple months ago, we had some awesome geyser pictures. Um, that is the water main we're looking to replace next year because of the liability that it poses out there. Um, for the storage side, this is going to be $3 million of the $4 million tank. I don't anticipate they'll actually finish it all in the fiscal year, so the next year, fiscal 20, we'll see a $1 million carryover on that. Um, for the pumping, the $1 million in pumping here, this would be to start off the pump station over at the Bittersweet Maintenance Yard. On the sanitary side, I've got about 550 earmarked for this. Primarily, this will be used for lift station improvements. Uh, for same, Similar to the stormwater stations, we have pumps, control systems that we need to upgrade. Uh, we, we want to continue televising and cleaning out our sanitary sewers, and we want to continue to make repairs to those sanitary sewers as we identify problems similar to what we just had on, on Route 21 over by Primo. The location for the water improvements that we specifically have in mind here will be Hunt Club Road here, the pump station up here, but the, and the Knowles Road water tower up in the corner there. All right. All right, looking at um, vehicles and equipment, uh, we try to look at these kind of on a 20-year basis so we know when large, more expensive pieces of equipment are coming in. You remember we had the ladder truck last year, a couple years ago, had a, had a big spike in the funding there. Um, so we have a total of 101 vehicles, 23 pieces of equipment. Some of the vehicles are shared between uh, public work and equipment are shared between the public works divisions. Uh, total replacement value here about just over 16.3 million. Uh, as I've, I've mentioned this a few times between uh, the capital plan and the, and the forecast, um, one of the things we can do to smooth out the funding requirements for this is to put, put it in a new fund, uh, just have a fund specifically designated for vehicles and equipment and kind of fund that on a five-year rolling average. Uh, that obviously will require some upfront money for that fund, and the timing is just not right to do that yet. So, um, but I didn't want to take it off the slide. Just wanted to mention it again. Um, when the timing's right and, and we were able to give that a little seed money, so to speak, uh, it's something that, that I'd like to take another look at. Uh, also included in this category is technology improvements. Uh, Chris does a great job working with departments and, and also doing uh, general IT network projects. Um, and he keeps a very detailed five-year plan million acronyms on there. I don't even know what they all mean, um, but I can tell you it is, uh, it's very detailed. So um, he's, he gives me that and we plug it into the plan here. Looking at fiscal year 19, total for the category 1.5 million. Uh, we took a harder look at this area this year um, and, and you can start to see the, the investment in the fleet starting to pay off, especially this year. Um, but we'll start with technology improvements. Total 258,000 um, and includes some projects for data storage, uh, the emergency operations center, uh, document management imaging system, preemption pre system, warning sirens, uh, EMS software, and then just some general network projects here. Now getting into the vehicle and equipment side, uh, the police department, uh, look through their vehicles and vehicle, vehicle and equipment list and uh, four new squads are proposed. On the fire side, one fire engine, Obviously, that's 625,000, so it <laughs> makes up for uh, not having another piece of equipment in there. Uh, on the public work street side, 365,000, that includes one small dump truck that actually replaces two, uh, and one large 10-yard dump truck. And on the utility side, uh, 51,000 for just a, one pickup truck there. So, And that is it for vehicles and equipment. So moving on to facilities. As you are aware, the Village of Gurney maintains five major facilities for our operations. Uh, we've broken them into different categories to help categorize things in the future. Um, we're not fully engaged in this yet, but we are doing a better job of documenting all of our expenses into these categories. The current forecast, because I can't even read from back there, would be projected 19 here, fiscal year 20, 21, 22, 23. Um, I will blame this on the fire department out here again. So uh, in the out years, we are looking at constructing another firehouse somewhere in the community. Um, obviously, it would be a huge capital investment to achieve that goal. Uh, so that's programmed in the out years. Um, but as you can see, even for this current upcoming fiscal year, there's a significant increase in the spend. Uh, and we'll get into the details here and decompose that a little bit for you. So for this year, we're looking at a total of about 825000 for facility specific. 
At the Village Hall in this facility, uh, we do need a new roof on this building. We had everything evaluated uh, in detail this summer, um, determine the entire scope of the roofing, and generally speaking, the entire roof needs to be replaced. Our estimate on that is about $170,000. We'll also be budgeting additional funds to perform interior improvements in the facility. Uh, we did some of the carpeting and the council chamber stuff this year. Um, we'd like to continue on with the carpeting project. Um, we also have money in there for replacing out lighting with high efficiency LED lighting um, as, as they come up. We're not doing a one fell swoop on that. We're just kind of picking them off one at a time as they kind of burn out. They're easy enough to do. At the police department, we have comm center tower and access control. About 85,000 budgeted for that. And the potential UPS carryover item. Uh, there is an action item on the agenda for right after this report uh, for a UPS replacement at the police department. Uh, due to the timelines on that, we're not entirely sure if it'll be completed before May 1st. So we are plugging in a carryover number in case it does span the fiscal year. We need to have budget money for it for next year. We also have $100,000 earmarked for interior and exterior improvements at the police facility. Uh, the building is getting to be about 15 years old at this point and is requiring regular maintenance on mechanicals, plumbing, electrical, and other things that are starting to get old and wear out. Station one, uh, fire department again wins the, the big number here. Uh, fire station one also needs a new roof. Uh, this is a ballasted flat roof at that location. Um, it needs to be completely replaced. Uh, they actually have rock up there, so they gotta take all the rock off the roof, remove all the rubber underlayment, replace the rubber underlayment, and then put the rock back on the roof. So. Uh, a little bit more intense that even the, the size of this facility being much larger, the, um, the amount of work effort required for that facility is significant. So we do have a $250,000 plug for that. Uh, there will be some additional interior and exterior work at Fire Station 1 to maintain serviceability. Uh, public, public Works facility and then the Village Park, we have $25,000 plugged. Uh, no specific projects on these at this time. Uh, we just know that there will be needs at those locations that will fall into the capital fund. Village Plaza. The Village Park, yeah. No, I know, but we prefer to call it Plaza. Oh, I'm sorry. Welton Plaza. <laughs> of course. Uh, so with that, uh, Brian and I are both here, obviously, to answer questions that you may have. Trustee Thornton. It just might be something minor, but two slides earlier, the fiscal year 2019 and 2023 buildings improvements, that you had a uh, bar chart with, like, a little bit of red and a little bit of blue. And in our copy and up there, I just don't know what that difference is. Sorry, that, that's uh, the funds they come from. The blue is the general capital fund. Um, that's non-water and sewer stuff, and the red is for the water and sewer. I apologize. I had a key on there, and it didn't carry over. Okay, thanks. Trustee Garner? Rocks on the roof. I know. Mm -hmm. is, there a, is there any reason why we got rocks on the roof? I don't know. It's a ballasted flat roof. I don't know the specifics on why that's done like that. Um, Chief, do you have any thoughts on this? They're supposed to be up there. I can tell you that. Yeah, I'm sure. bush, bush stone. I can tell you we've had two different uh, contractors come up and take the roof. Uh, both of them are proposing not putting rocks back on the roof. Um, years ago, that's how they held the weight of the roof down. So when you had heavy winds, the rubbers so large if it got up under one corner it could take the entire roof off so the rocks are really just there for weight um, both people that are looking at replacing it neither one is recommending rocks however until we write the rfp or this gets through the budget i i don't know the exact roof we'll be putting up on there yet a lot more study i think dave henderson I, might have a good explanation yeah. for it as well so. <clears throat> <laughs> he wants to leave on it Back okay, Very so common. 25 Every years have gone by probably. and things are different. We'll have a lot of free rocks to give away come spring. <laughs> um, on the communications plan that we're doing for next year, we need to start popping in information about the water tower <clears throat> so no one's taken by surprise and start talking about the benefits. We might even consider a sign out there, future home, Village Gurney water tower. I know we have a sign department that might be able to do that um, that's a great idea we'll get on that right after the new year yeah I just I think everybody we've done a good job of why we need to do it but again just like changing Halloween there, there has been significant time lag since the zoning yeah. approvals and the construction at this point um, generally speaking I think a lot of people are aware of it yeah. maybe not necessarily the location but homes change and new people move in and then they put something on next door and then the next thing we know we got 103 comments 
So I, I just think we need to keep reminding people and then the benefits. It's you know a little bit here and there, maybe a sign. So I think it's a very ambitious plan, well thought out, covers everything, very expensive. <laughs> this stuff is not cheap, and you know it was built, and now we got to maintain it. So, all right, thank you thank very you much, Brian. Thank you for the opportunity Brian, and, and the continued support. Scott. Okay, yeah. I mean, as you take a look at it, it's a lot to take in. And as you think about it, like I said, if anything comes up, um, obviously, anytime, feel free to give us a call. The sooner the better, so we can get that plugged in if there's changes that need to be made. Otherwise, um, we will continue to refine the numbers and talk about it in February and then talk about it again at the budget hearing in March. All right, that's only reports. Uh, we have no old business, Correct. so we'll move on to new business which is approval of the police department's request to waive bidding requirements and award police department uninterrupted power supply and automatic transfer switch upgrade project to Kelso Burnett Company at a cost not to exceed $190,000. I think after watching what happened in Atlanta, <clears throat> just do this. Yeah, so I'll walk you through this quick and then Deputy Chief Campbell is our subject matter expert with the assistance of Mr. Henderson. Um, so the police department, when it loses power, we do have a backup generator that comes online um, to power uh, the building and then critical systems like the communication center. If both the ComEd power and the generator uh, fail, then we have our UPS, which provides about one hour of power um, while staff scrambles to try to get the power back up. Um, when it was in constructed in 2003, it was designed with a single UPS and a single automatic transfer switch and both of them are a single point of failure um, for the building. Um, we've known this for some time now, and it's kept many people up at night thinking about worst case scenarios if both the generator and ComEd power went down. Um, and now that we have partnered with Zion and are looking to bring other uh, communities on board uh, for dispatching, it's really been pushed to the forefront. Um, another issue that we have going on are that the capacitors in our current UPS are beyond their useful life, and those need to be replaced as well. So. Couple different issues going on. Uh, when we uh, conducted the rebuttal of the communication center um, this past year, we laid the groundwork for having a parallel automatic transfer switch and parallel uh, UPS systems. So we set up um, workstations with A and B outlets. So if uh, system A went down, they could switch to system B. So some of that groundwork has already been laid. Um, and with that being done, um, the department's ready to go to the next step. So it worked in conjunction with uh, J.J. Henderson and then also obviously had people from the police department, um, Chris and his staff involved as far as putting a plan together to build a redundant system that would put us in a, a better spot than we are right now. Uh, so they looked at, looked at that. Uh, the proposed plan is a, an A and B system where you would have A and B automatic transfer switches, A and B um, UPSs, um, and then replace the capacitors in the, the current UPS. So that would by us about another 10 to 15 years on that. So um, Kelso Burnett is the company that performed the electrical work with the communications remodel. Uh, very impressed with their knowledge and the work they did. So we included them um, in the plan uh, for this new system. Worked hand in hand with him. Uh, they gave us a quote um, for the second uh, UPS system and the automatic transfer switch, 162,500, and then another 15,000 to replace the capacitors in the current UPS. So that comes to 177500 in total. Uh, given the complexity of the project, staff's requested that a little wiggle room uh, be built in. So we're requesting a not to exceed limit of $190,000. Um, so as this project um, will benefit consolidation, it is something that we will uh, be taking to the Northeast Lake County Consolidated ETSB and looking for them to um, participate in some of the, the cost of this. So the initial thought is that we would bring 50% of this um, to that group and ask for reimbursement. Obviously, that's a, a separate board um, that would need to consider that and vote on it. Um, but it is something that we feel um, would be reimbursable underneath the bylaws. So if, if that were the case, we brought that forward to the Northeast um, Lake County ETSB or Joint ETSB. Uh, for 50% reimbursement, then the real net out-of-pocket to the village's budget would be $95,000. Um, looking for the wave of bid, uh, Kelso Burnett's the company we've worked with before. 
um, if we went out to bid on this, it would require detailed electrical drawings, et cetera. That would just extend the time frame and push up the cost. So we don't think going out to bid is really going to be any savings related to either time or money. Um, and as I said, you know, this has existed like this for a long time. But the sooner we get this done, um, the sooner a lot more people will be sleeping better um, at night and, and just protect us. Because as the mayor said, we don't want to have a situation where the communication center goes down and then get it back up. And Chris and his team having to restart all that stuff, I mean, they have no idea how yeah. long that this would take. This isn't just the electricity. This is the technology that goes out, yeah. too. And that's so restarting all that stuff would not be good. So as I said, I'm looking to move forward with this uh, with Kelso Burnett at a not to exceed of $190,000 um, under the pretense that we would be taking a request to the joint ETSB for reimbursement on a portion of it. And that's my 10,000 foot summary. So if Did there's miss technical questions, I'm not your guy. Those people are out there. I appreciate you and Deputy Chiefs work on this too and making and Chris is to bringing it to the forefront getting the sense of urgency around it and figuring it out guiding everybody he's my personal hero good, on many good occasions team. really good team effort I know I know but you are always you've been my a personal hero on many on this project many times so greatly appreciated questions from the trustees trustee Jacobs what happens if we don't get it back up and running after an hour? <laughs> Walkie talkies. So, so we have an arrangement uh, for 901 to fail over to the city of Waukegan. It's a reciprocal arrangement, works both ways. So we would actually have personnel that would go to the Waukegan Dispatch Center and operate from there. Um, that's been in place for, I think, since 1991, something like that something that we'll revisit over time as both centers have, have changed and whatnot, but that is the plan It's already put in place where basically they flip a switch and all the 9 -1 calls and whatnot are transferred to the other center and vice versa. But that time that you have on the UPS gives you enough time to start put those that all in motion so that if you need to do that for whatever reason. Now we've decreased the chances of having to do that because now we're eliminating single points of failure we'd be able to operate on one half of the system and still dispatch from our location. So it increases the, the chances that we wouldn't be in that situation, but you still need to plan for it. You never know exactly what the circumstances, if it's a tornado or something like that, you can affect uh, you know, all the systems in a particular building. I hope that answers your question. Sure. Now that just brings out another question. You just brought up a tornado. What if a tornado comes through town, heads east, and knocks out Waukegan? Well, I think I think what you'll see in the long-term plan, um, when you see what Lake County is looking to do with regional dispatch and consolidation and things like that, that you're going to see um, buildings and facilities of a nature that could even withstand a, a direct hit from a tornado. That's the long-term uh, planning where this is going. You see a few of those centers around the state, not very many. But that may be long, long, long term in terms of how that develops. But I know that the county is, is interested in it. Um, we're going to revisit our backup uh, facilities over time here, but uh, it's not something we're looking to take on at the same time we're, we're wrapping up things with Zion and other potential partners. We also have relationships with the with the state with ILEAS, uh, which can provide uh, mobile resources, command posts that can come in with temporary communication support if that worst case scenario were to happen. All right, thank you, Trustee Thorstenson. So, well, um, thanks for all the details. I believe it's definitely smart to do the UPS upgrade, especially now since it's not just Gurney and we're impacting other communities. I'm also glad to see that we could do it in eight to 10 weeks because uh, as the mayor prefaced this now would be better, you know, than, but uh, eight to 10 weeks is doable. I guess the question I have is on uh, ETSB, if, what's their motivation to provide 50% payment? So, so for those 91 related expenditures, the, uh, overriding state chat statute on how ETSBs work and things like that is you can take a percentage of any d attributable cost to the dispatching of 911 calls. 
So when you look at all the activities that go on the center, you can say that at least 50% of that is directly related to 911 calls. So it's a, uh, a viable expense where you may get into some difficulties if you said that you were gonna pay 100% of that UPS cost. It also supports the operation of the door control system for the police station, for some of the servers and other equipment that are police station related and not attributable to 911. So that's the rationale for coming up with a percentage split between those. So, so they're you're saying their charter or their yeah. purpose is really um, yes. essentially to cover part of these costs. <clears throat> right, the emergency telephone system board um, system was set up to help have a direct funding mechanism for providing 911 service. <clears throat> so in the initial setup of that, a lot of it was the initial equipment, um, the 911 trunks, um, it was very local to start with. Now you're seeing it more come under the control of a single uh, Illinois State Police Authority. Um, you see ETSBs coming together uh, as part of the consolidation process, but there's still that fundamental mandate for providing items directly related to 911 service, computer-aided dispatch, the ability of a, people to have that single number to call and they get the fastest possible response to get units dispatched is the, the underlying principle there. Thank you. No. Make a motion to approve, second. I have a motion from Trustee Balmas, second from Trustee Thorstenson. <clears throat> Roll call, please. Ross. Aye. Garner. Aye. Balmas. Aye. Hood. Yes. Thorstenson. Yes. Jacobs. Aye. Six high. Motion carries. Good work. This is the kind of stuff that keeps us off CNN. <clears throat> All right. Next item. Item number two. Approval of <clears throat> Ordinance 2017-57. Approving the collective bargaining agreement between the Illinois Council of Police, which is the communications operators, and the Village of Gurney for the term beginning May 1st, 2017 through April 30th, 2020. Sure. Uh, we talked about this back in October in an executive session. Um, nothing has changed since that time. We're just waiting on the, the bargaining unit to vote on the contract, which they did uh, pass unanimous, unanimously. Um, just a reminder of uh, some of the highlights. Uh, CPI formula for wages, which was already being used for this group and is used for uh, police and fire as well. 2.25% uh, wage adjustment retroactive to May 1 which is consistent with uh, what we had in for other groups and budget assumptions. Uh, the addition of EMD certification pay, uh, which is an extra half a percent uh, when they receive their uh, emergency medical dispatch uh, certification. This was an exchange for uh, top pay employees no longer being eligible for a non-recurring bonus. And then finally, just a three-year term on the contract. So uh, pretty straightforward. And as I said, no changes from what we talked about um, last time we discussed it. Make a motion to approve. Second. All right, I have a motion from Trustee Balmas. Second from Trustee Garner. Roll call, please, Andy. <coughs> Ross. Aye. Garner. Aye. Balmas. Aye. Hood. Yes. Thorstenson. Yes. Jacobs. Aye. Six aye. Motion carries. <coughs> I will reopen the floor for public comment if anyone would like to address the board tonight. And come to the microphone. If not, I will say Merry Christmas, Happy Kwanzaa, Happy New Year. We'll all get to back together in 2018. So it's been a very good year for us, and I, I sincerely hope you all have a wonderful holiday, safe with family and friends. So with that said, so motion. motion to adjourn. I have a motion from Trustee Balma, second from Trustee Jacobs. All in favor say aye. 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 We are adjourned. <laughs>